Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The International Space Station is arguably one of the greatest achievements of the 21st century. It's the largest and most complex spacecraft ever built, and it's been continuously occupied for over 21 years. But as long as it's been operating, there's always been an end date in sight, and that date has moved over time. Back in the Bush era, they expected the International Space Station to end its operation in 2016. And while US lawmakers have assured funding through 2030, there's occasionally disagreements with Russia where they decide that they're going to leave early and then change their mind. But either way, there will likely come a day when the space station's operational life comes to an end and under international space law, the countries that launched it are responsible for disposing of it. Now, I'm going to say I would love for the International Space Station to be pushed up into a parking orbit and left there for space archaeologists. But most of the work done on the space station's end-of-life scenarios have involved deorbiting it into the atmosphere. And, you know, you might think that's not such a big deal. After all, satellites deorbit all the time. We've just literally watched a Dragon spacecraft deorbit from space and land in the Gulf of Mexico. But the space station is so much bigger and so much less manoeuvrable, it takes a lot of work to be able to deorbit it safely. And by safely, I mean that if this spacecraft comes down, it will leave a debris trail thousands of kilometers long because different parts of the space station will land in different places. Things will break off. As the space station falls below 120 kilometers, the solar panels and radiators will start tearing off and those will fall early along the track. By the time it gets below about 100 kilometers, the modules will actually start to separate from each other. And once we're down below about 70, the modules are just disintegrating and there's like heavy things like propellant tanks which will continue along their orbital track as sort of monolithic objects and land far down range. The debris track can be made shorter by having the space station descend into the atmosphere faster, and this means having its perigee deeper inside the atmosphere. So if the final perigee is about 75 kilometers, the debris track could be as long as 7,000, 8,000 kilometers. If you drop the perigee down to 50 kilometers, it might only be 2,000 kilometers long. So you want to target this perigee such that the orbit is over the ocean, and if you can, get it as deep inside the atmosphere as possible or make sure you've got as much ocean to work with as possible. And given that we're dealing with space safety, ideally both. So for a typical spacecraft in a near circular orbit around the Earth, the deorbit is carried out using a single deorbit burn, which slows the orbit down and drops the perigee on the other side of the orbit inside the atmosphere, typically to about 70 kilometers. And then, of course, atmospheric drag takes over and the spacecraft can land. Now, in the case of the Dragon coming down from an orbit that was about 400 kilometers up, it needed to burn its tiny Draco thrusters for 16 minutes to drop the perigee close enough that the vehicle would re-enter and land quickly. But to target the Gulf of Mexico, they had to wait until they were 45 minutes away from crossing the Gulf of Mexico and then perform their deorbit burn. Because you've got to understand that if you burn in one place, it's the other side of the orbit, 45 minutes away, where you're adjusting the altitude. As a rough rule of thumb, if your spacecraft is in low Earth orbit, for every meter per second you slow your orbit, you drop your perigee by about 3.3 kilometers. So if you're in a 400 kilometer circular orbit and you want to drop your perigee into the atmosphere at 70, you need to have about 100 meters per second of delta V. The main propulsion on the space station are the pair of engines on the Zvezda service module. And together, they generate a thrust of about 603 kilograms of force. That translates to an acceleration of about 0.15% of a G, or 1.5 centimeter per second per second. These engines have access to about 800 kilograms of propellant, and if you fire them for about 340 seconds, you will deplete that supply to zero and get a total delta V of about 4.5 meters per second. So that is clearly a long way from what is needed to bring the space station down from its current orbit. Now, there's a couple of pieces of good news here. First of all, you can add more propellant and engines with a visiting spacecraft. But more importantly, the space station will actually perform most of its deorbit from altitude 
by using atmospheric drag. Those solar panels can be adjusted to increase the drag if necessary, and you can actually bring the space station down from its operating orbit to the atmosphere in under two years. But doing it entirely using atmospheric drag means you can't control where it lands. But you can get the majority of the deorbiting through atmospheric drag and then switch to engines for controlling the final landing point. But there's another complication. Controlling the space station becomes harder as you get down lower in the atmosphere. The space station's attitude is controlled by a set of control moment gyros, and these electrically powered flywheels are used to orient the station. But at a certain point, atmospheric drag on the station becomes sufficiently uh, asymmetric that it saturates these and you need to start using rocket thrusters. This probably happens at around 250 kilometers, and at this point, you're literally a few weeks away from deorbiting the station completely. But for every day the station can't control its attitude with the gyros, it has to use propellant. So you have to account for that in the propellant supplies that are going to be on board. It's probably about 100 kilograms per day, according to most estimates. Now, I said that Zvezda only has 800 kilograms of propellant on it, but Zarya, the core of the station, has about six tons of propellant space. It, it can pump that into the Zvezda module, but it takes about a day to fill up the 800 kilogram tank, so it can't continuously run the engines on uh, Zvezda using that propellant. To get more Delta V for a final descent burn, you need to have extra spacecraft. And this is what the Progress spacecraft frequently does. Usually there is a Progress spacecraft parked in the aft docking port of the station because they will actually use the main engine on Progress to boost the orbit. The reason being that the main engines on the service module in Zvezda have a limited lifespan and by using the engines on the Progress, you avoid using up that limited lifespan. So the Progress main engine provides 300 kilograms of thrust and it can work from a propellant supply of 800 kilograms. So that actually gives you the same delta V as the uh, service module would. But Progress also comes with a set of rendezvous and docking thrusters. These are the small attitude control engines that are used to make sure they can dock. And these can actually burn for much longer and they can actually drain propellant directly from the tanks on Zarya. The station is designed so that the Progress spacecraft that are docked can provide attitude control and they can draw their propellant from the Zarya if necessary. So the R&D engines, rendezvous and docking engines on the back of a Progress add another 100 kilograms of thrust and those can go for a lot longer. And if you're able to use the R&D thrusters, you can actually have another two Progress attached, one on the top and one on the bottom of the station, and they can use their lateral thrusters to provide extra push during that final deorbit burn. So adding all these spacecraft increases the delta V you have for that final deorbit burn, and that means that you can start the deorbit burn from a higher and higher altitude, and that helps because as you get lower and lower down, there's more things that can go wrong, and you lose chances for you know to correct mistakes. So this all works for a deorbit that's planned at the end of life of the station. But it could be that there's a contingency scenario where things go wrong and the station is damaged in some way. One of the most likely scenarios over the life of the station is there's a, a, a debris strike which causes significant depressurization on the station and it has to be abandoned. Now it's possible that they can get other vehicles there to help with the deorbit, you know, because these are automated vehicles, it's entirely possible that could work. But there is a problem with the electronics on the Russian segment of the station. They are only guaranteed or certified to remain operational for 180 days in vacuum. Therefore, if the station gets depressurized and they have to begin disposal operations, they have a very short window to bring this down. They can't rely on the gentle drag of the atmosphere to bring them down. They have to actually use more of that propellant reserves to get it down quickly. But of course, that means using some of the propellant you would need for the final deorbit burn. The, the people that have done the math on this estimate that it needs between 7 and 9 tons of propellant, and that's more than is generally on the station. So the station wouldn't necessarily be able to safely deorbit from this configuration, but it might have enough life in, left in it to boost to a higher orbit, giving the people on the ground time to figure out how to actually deorbit the station safely. And I'm sure there are engineers who have given this a lot of thought. I'm Scott Manley. 
Fly safe.